Hi, this is Matt Ingram with another replication. This time we're reproducing findings from Clemens, Crespin, and Finocchiaro, uh, published in Legislative Studies Quarterly in 2015, February 2015. This, uh, as with other replications, we're, we're, we're reproducing the, the main, the core empirical results from this paper in several different environments, uh, but this video is dedicated to the re replication in R. Uh, the replication data was obtained directly from the authors, so so thank you to the authors. And their analysis was done original in, originally in Stata. <coughs> we are trying to reproduce the main results I in environments other than the uh, commercial package data. Uh, please, as a, as a note of caution, please do not share or circulate this data beyond class without first uh, contacting the authors and obtaining permission directly from them. Thank you. Uh, one last note regarding preliminaries. By this time, you should be very familiar with all of the different software environments in which we've been working, or programming environments in which we've been working. So I assume you've downloaded and installed R and all required packages, and also that you've downloaded all of the replication materials, including the replication assignment uh, from Blackboard. So looking specifically at the replication steps, first we're going to reproduce figure 1, which was the basic descriptive distribution of total earmarks. That's the variable labeled PORC10 in the data set. Then we need to generate an, a grid reference, the XY coordinates, uh, that are necessary for every geographically weighted regression. And uh, if, if we're working in the standalone software package GWR4, we need to generate those XY coordinates in another environment. It just so happens that the authors included the XY coordinates in, this, in their replication data, but just assuming that we didn't have those, we want to understand how to get those. In R, uh, it, one of the nice advantages of R is that we can generate those coordinates internally uh, within R with a single line. Uh, so then we want to, <coughs> with this grid reference object in hand, we want to reproduce the main results reported in Table 1. These are the OLS results and uh, the GWR results. One thing to keep in mind while doing the, this main part of the analysis is to assess the motivation for the GWR analysis in the first place. Uh, that is, you should be asking yourself, what evidence is offered by the authors, either before or after the GWR, that the coefficients are indeed stationary or non-stationary. And then lastly, figure 2 contains six maps that we want to reproduce. Five of those maps uh, graph the local coefficients generated by GWR for the main predictors of interest, and the sixth map uh, graphs the local R-squared. Throughout, we'll be discussing multiple diagnostics, uh, but for now, let's, let's turn our attention to the main article and to the replication assignment. So here's the main article and the replication assignment. Let's pull them apart here so that we can see them side by side. So there you can see the the original article on the left and then the replication assignment on the right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You can see some preliminary notes at the top of the replication assignment. Then there's a description of the variables, a description of the main of the dependent variable, and then a description of the five uh, predictors of interest. Next, the replication assignment shifts to the specific replication items, starting with figure one, moving to the grid reference, as I mentioned, then table of one, and then finally uh, figure two. So. If we start with figure one, let's move to the article, and that figure one is the map with the basic geographic distribution of the outcome of interest. Uh, pork barrel spending, or more formally, total house earmarks. These are earmarks uh, from the 110th Congress, so from uh, <coughs> excuse me, 2007 to 2009. And this map in figure one is a basic uh, quintile map showing the outcome of interest across five distributions. Um, these aren't necessarily the, the quintiles themselves, but if we generate a quintile map, we should come close to approximating uh, this distribution. I say quintile because we have five categories, essentially 
four breaks between these five categories. So let's move to R and, and get started on these replication items. Here we are in R. Let me just clear the console here. And we have our standard introductory materials above. Uh, again, my thanks to the authors for sharing their replication data. Um, some preliminary notes regarding a basic overview of the replication. You might think of this as an outline. Uh, some helpful commands that are that sometimes can shed some light ac across many replications. Uh, then a reminder to update R and install any packages that might be missing. Also remember that once you install the packages, you need to access them or call them, require them, open them. And uh, then here are some helpful cam commands to remember um, that will let you know which packages are installed and which packages are loaded into the current session. The next thing you want to do is to set your working directory. That's what I've done here with this command. I'll highlight the command and hit Control R to execute. You can see it execute successfully in the console in the upper left. Just a reminder that this is my working directory. Make sure you change this file path to reflect your own working directory and then you can check the contents of, of that working directory with either of these commands list files or directory. Uh, you can see here um, that I've I've got these files in my working directory. There's the the basic shapefile documents that we're going to access in just a second. So then uh, we can skip down here to establishing the path for the shapefile, um, and that's just a path to the working directory. And then we can use that command in the read OGR, or we can use that path object rather in this command, the read OGR command, to load the shapefile, including its uh, PRJ or projection component. So the syntax of the read OGR command is read OGR, open parentheses, the path to that command, and then the name of the shapefile without the shapefile extension. So we can execute that, and you see up in the top left that the shapefile computer is a little bit slow right now. There, it's just loaded. So you can lo see it loads successfully. Um, this, this is different than loading a shapefile with this command, for instance where you don't need to specify the working directory. It assumes that you're already headed to that working directory or you're already working in the directory that you've established as your working directory. And then this is the name of a shapefile from a separate project, but you would have to include the shapefile extension and then your ID number. So again, this read OGR command is helpful if you have a projection component in your as part of your shapefile, which we do in this case. So we could summarize the shapefile, or we could extract the data frame into a data object, which we'll do there. Then you could look at the names of all the variables in the data object, which we will also do. So here we are with all of our variable names. Again, the, this shapefile happens to include a lot of the results already that the authors, uh, from, from the author's original analysis. Uh, so here are the main variables, right, the dependent variable, and then five predictors of interest. And you also see the xy coordinates down here, which you, you could use to construct a, uh, your own grid reference object. And then in between are all of the local um, coefficients from the GWR analysis, along with some other diagnostic standard errors, local r squared, etc. Uh, we could ignore all of this since we're going to generate it ourselves again. Um, but just know that it's there as part of the as part of the data. We really are going to act as if these were the only variables in the data set. An identifier and then our dependent variable and our independent variable. So having loaded the shapefile and then extracted the data frame and attach, now we want to attach this data. Um, <laughs> here are some other commands that you could use to uh, read the shapefile. As I said before, you could write a shapefile uh, or you could generate a projection component if you didn't already have one. We're going to skip ahead here. 
Uh, so let's look at the very basic plot just to confirm that we're working with a correct geography. Hit Control R, and there we see the United States and the 400 plus uh, congressional districts um, in the United States. To get a little bit more detail, we could plot it with the axes or we could plot it with the names of the congressional districts. Let's go ahead and do that. And there you see some identifiers for each of the districts and with some uh, uh, XY information on the axes for, for this plot. If we wanted to continue, we could, to get a sense of the dependent variable, we could plot a histogram. That's with 20 breaks. We can see that it's somewhat skewed. Uh, but if we wanted to get a figure that was close to figure 1, uh, this is where we would begin. Right? We want to extract uh, five, five, qu five quantiles, or the quintiles. So we want to extract these quintiles, quantiles using this quantile command from this variable, the pork 10 variable, in the shape object moving from 0 to 100 percent of the observations by 20 percent increments, or by fifths, that is. So we can execute this command, um, and then we can use that quant object to plot the different breaks down below. So for instance, we could plot just a basic uh, plot of, of the shape object, of the shape file object, and this variable pork 10 using this command without giving any additional information about how to break up the the variables. And that would result in this object. Now that's that's not too far off from this object. You see that the higher values are include the Dakotas and a, a district in Southern California, a district in Wisconsin, and those all are all the same uh, districts that are popping up in figure one in the original publication as having the highest values. You see also some in western, what looks like western Pennsylvania. Those are the same uh, districts that are popping up as yellow, some of the highest uh, earmark values. So this is essentially a replication of figure one, but if we wanted to do it in grayscale, we could add a few more, um, a, a, a few more, um, we could expand on this syntax to, to define the plot more correctly. Here's one example of what we could do using this quants break or this quant object. So we could execute that. And that you see, don't see too much change here, but now you see the title up above and there the boundaries are slightly different, but basically this is the same map. Now really the map that's closest to figure one is this one down here. I'm going to take away the axes just to expand the map out a little bit more and then make it in grayscale using slightly different syntax than this than this find interval just using um, the R color brewer package. So that's what this map looks like. It's executing now and should draw in just a couple of seconds. And there it is. So this is our closest approximation to figure one. Again, as, as we said already, if we compare this side by side with the original article publication or the original article figure, uh, they're essentially the same graph. You see the Dakotas again, the district in Southern California, and some of the other districts that show up with higher values in figure one. So there's our figure one. Now moving forward, if we look at the article and go to table one, that's our next main result. So we want to generate some OLS results and generate the geographically weighted regression results. So how might we move about that in R? Step 5a includes some general preliminaries for OLS that you might want to do in any one of your own. Um, projects including getting some descriptive info on your on your variables on your independent variables and then trying to get a sense of the correlations across your variables uh, just in case you're trying to diagnose uh, potential 
problems like multicollinearity in advance or trying to anticipate some of those problems. We'll skip that right now since we don't have very much information on that in the original article. So here is the original, here's the main OLS model. And we can highlight that and hit Control R to execute. You can see it executed successfully up here on the left. And then we can summarize that model and extract the model fit uh, statistic, the AIC, here as well. So here are our main OLS results and we could compare those again side by side with the article. Let's just look at one coefficient just to, as one sort of um, check on whether we're replicating the findings for ideology, which is the key predictor in the analysis, you see that it has a negative sign, it's a negative coefficient, and it's 644.3. We get exactly the same uh, coefficient, negative and 644.3 in our own analysis. And our AIC value is 80.39 in the, in the original article. It's an adjusted version of AIC, but here you see it's 80.41.38. So our findings are being replicated pretty closely. Hang on just a second. So at least at this stage, everything looks fine. We're, we're moving along with the replication. Now we want to generate these results on the right-hand side. So moving forward with the GWR analysis, there's a couple of preliminaries. We want to create that grid reference. So we could follow something like this, where we create a new object by binding the x-coordinate variable and the y-coordinate variable from the data provided by the authors. However, there's also just the single line of command in R, which extracts the coordinates for each one of your objects. So it's going to extract the coordinates for the centroid in each one of your uh, polygons. So we can hit Control R. Now we have this new object, chords, which is the coordinates. If you call it, you can see that it has one column for the x, val x variable, or x coordinate, excuse me. And if we just scroll up, this is going to be your x coordinate and this is going to be your y coordinate. So now we want to do a quick um, diagnostic test to, to check for the presence of stationarity, or rather to, to test for the presence of non-stationarity. And this is a nice package, GW model, that offers a Monte Carlo uh, randomization test for stationarity. There's some sample code here from Roger Vivend, but the code that applies to the piece in Legislative Studies Quarterly from 2015 is the one that follows below this highlighted line. So the first thing that we need to generate is a, a distance matrix using the coordinates object. So we can do that with that command, control R. Um, and then we want to create a bandwidth for this Monte Carlo test. We're going to create two. One, as you can tell here, is fixed. That is, it's, it's distance-based. So this, this adaptive equals false means that it is not adaptive, so it is fixed. So that's going to be a distance-based bandwidth. We can hit Control R and generate that. And then the second one you can see here it says adaptive equals true. So this one is going to be not distance-based, but rather based on the number of nearest neighbors, or the optimum number of nearest neighbors. So we'll run that one as well. And, uh, you can see here at the top, this was the first one. So based on distance, that looks like uh, it's going to be about 2,000 kilometers. These are usually meters. And here it's going to be 373 nearest neighbors out of 400 and some total uh, units. So this is a very high percentage of the units that are being used uh, in this Monte Carlo test, so just to keep that in mind. So here is the code for the randomization test. We, just to, to keep those bandwidth sizes in mind, we could go back and specify uh, a certain size for these uh, bandwidths, but let's these were selected via an optimization process. So let's leave them as is and execute the Monte Carlo randomization test. So here is the first one with the fixed bandwidth, and 
this but will take probably about five or six minutes so I'm just going to pause the video for a second. And here are the results in the top left in the console. You can see uh, one p-value for each one of the five predictors. And uh, this is how you would interpret this Monte Carlo uh, test. Basically the null hypothesis is that th the effect is stationary. That is, the effect is uniform or even across all 400 plus spatial units here. So if every for any one of these test values that's above 0.05, equal to or above 0.05, you can say we would accept the null hypothesis. However, for those values that are below 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. That is, we reject the hypothesis that it's stationary, and now we have uh, the possibility of non-stationarity. So th th here, then the only one, the only predictor that clearly looks non-stationary and that would motivate, therefore, the GWR analysis is the nominate score, that is the ideology variable. Uh, power, the uh, power index variable is significant at the 0.10 level, um, but otherwise none of the other variables motivate the G GWR analysis. We could run the same test again with the, uh, the adaptive uh, bandwidth. So here the only thing that changes here is the is the bandwidth here, bandwidth 2. Up, up above we use bandwidth 1. So now let's run this and this again will take five or six minutes or so so I'll just pause briefly. And here you see the results of the second Monte Carlo test in the, in the console in the top left. Now nothing is significant by conventional uh, um, cutoffs. Before, power had been significant at the 0.10 level, so we could reject the null hypothesis of stationarity with regards to the power predictor, but now we cannot do so. And strictly speaking, we cannot do so for the ideology variable either, although that's right at 05. But, but again, strictly speaking, we, we'd want a, a p-value of below 0.05. Uh, so we could still use this to motivate the GWR analysis, uh, but these tests uh, suggest that, um, again, a strict reading of these tests would, su would suggest that all variables are stationary. The effect of all of our predictors are, is stationary, so we should stick with the OLS analysis. But let's push forward with the, with the replication, and um, and that means choosing a kernel type here and then optimizing the bandwidth again. Uh, we could use BW1 and BW2, but we'll just run through the um, optimization process in case the Monte Carlo test uh, was for some reason not available or you didn't do it or you didn't generate the, the bandwidths in that way. Here are our, uh, some other methods for generating bandwidths uh, using the SP GWR or the GWR packages. So here we have the GWR select command. This is going to uh, select the kernel and then optimize the bandwidth. So we have that command and here is the syntax. Uh, we're selecting based on CV, not AIC. Uh, so that's something that you could also vary. Uh, selecting by AIC can be very time consuming. So we do this to, to, to economize on time, and here we see our coordinates uh, object. So this is our first bandwidth. We're going to do a bi-square, um, excuse me, yeah, an adaptive bi-square. Uh, here you see adaptive is true, so this is going to be an adaptive bi-square, so it's going to be a nearest neighbors um, bandwidth. As the authors note in, the, in their article, uh, where you have units that vary in size. So looking at figure one here, we have lots of small units east of the Mississippi, lots of very large units west of the Mississippi. Where this is the case, if you did a fixed distance based bandwidth, you would count for, for units out in the in the west, uh, say Wyoming right here, you would capture very few neighbors 
at a fixed distance, whereas the same fixed distance on the east coast, pretty much anywhere on the east coast, would capture a very large number of units. So where you have this pattern of, of units of varying size, you want to use an adaptive bandwidth, picking by a, a number of nearest neighbors or a percentage of units, and then every unit has that number of nearest neighbors. So that's what we do here in adaptive BS1. We're going to generate that object, control R, and then we're going to generate three other options just for robustness checks down the road. Uh, here you see in the console that this, the way, this, what this means is that the bandwidth includes about 86 percent of the total observations. So we can do a fixed version, distance-based version of that one, and that's what that means, or that's what we're doing there. And then we can do more, three more the Gaussian versions of both of the ones we just did. So we'll just highlight this and hit Control R and generate those. So now we've got in memory four different bandwidths that we could uh, that we could draw upon. Uh, here's some more options if you're interested, but I'm going to skip that for now. And then here is the GWR model estimation. If you're interested about the commands, you're, you you go for this help GWR. Um, and this is the syntax. So GWR, the model, uh, under adapt you would identify the bandwidth that we just did and then the kernel type here, the coordinates object, and then some other syntax that we, we won't go into now, but here is the basic um, command. This last hat matrix extracts the hat matrix you'd need that to identify some influence statistics which we can extract from this from this from the object that's created or from the result that's created. So here we would estimate our first model. This is our 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 best model as far as we know right now using a an adaptive bi square um, bandwidth based on nearest neighbors just as the authors do uh, and and that we optimized previously. So we can hit control R this will estimate the model in a matter of a few seconds. There it's done. And now we can call the results of that model or call that, op that object and we see here the GWR results. So we have our 432 congressional districts and here are our predictors including the constant or intercept. We could compare those to those in table one and here you see that the mean is minus 0.556 for ideology. So the best thing we could compare that to is the median here. It's not going to be the same. Uh, most GWR analysis report the median with uh, the first and third quartiles and then minimum and maximum values. But the authors here report the mean. We could extract the mean um, by, by simply calculating the mean. Uh, but we won't do that right now. If we can focus on the first and third quartiles um, minus 899 to minus 0.296. Uh, actually, those aren't sorry, those aren't reported either uh, by the authors. So if you just look at the minimum and maximum, then you see the minimum is minus 1,046. That's a that's a smaller value than the minimum for the authors. Um, the maximum is minus 4784. Uh, we they get a maximum that's positive in nature. So for our results, ideology always has a negative effect across all 432 spatial units. For the original paper, ideology did at some times have a positive effect. Recall that their this is one of their key this is probably the, their key uh, um, proposition, right? That um, the, remember the ideology value takes a negative value. If it's a liberal um, representative, a positive value. If it's a, a conservative representative, so the idea was that as you become more conservative, you get less. There's less pork barreling, or there's fewer earmarks. So there should be a negative sign on this coefficient. In our results, this coefficient is always negative, even though it varies in magnitude. In their results, uh, it looks like it's mostly negative, since the mean is negative but they do get some positive coefficients suggesting that the relationship is, is reversed at some point, though perhaps not statistically significant. 
So we could go through each coefficient and compare the minimum and maximum, the distribution of these variables. We won't do that right now. Um, but that, that would, this would be the information that would be, you would basically use to replicate the results in table one. You've got in the final column, remember, the global results and that's the OLS results. Those are the global model is also the OLS model. Some people refer to it as the global regression model. So in this output here you have all of the information you need to reproduce table one, including the statistics down below, the model fit statistics and other and other statistics. So now let's go to our last replication item which uh, consists of figure two, the six maps in figure two. Here are those maps. Let's just rotate the view so uh, we don't have to um, tweak our necks here and expand them out a little bit. And here we have our maps then. So we want to reproduce these six maps for ideology, for demand, seniority, the appropriations power index, presidential vote share, and the local R squared. These are maps of the local coefficients from the GWR analysis. So the, these local coefficients vary. Um, the authors are stating that they're, they're non-stationary, right? So the, the sign, the magnitude, and the statistical significance of each of these coefficients varies across all 432 spatial units. And so they're they're eliminating all of the non-significant uh, coefficients, which is a, a, a good practice, because just mapping all of the coefficients, regardless of significance, does, is not very informative. We're only interested in those coefficients that are statistically significant. And so you see that best in these top three maps, where there's lots of white space indicating um, statistically non-significant uh, coefficients. And then the color identifies the magnitude of the effect, and then you can look down at the legend and identify the direction of the effect. So for ideology, for instance, you see that these, these are the only congressional districts where ideology is statistically significant, and it's always negative, even though the magnitude of that negative effect varies widely. So let's reproduce all five of these predictor maps, and then this map of local R squared. If we go back to R, um, you can see back to our GWR analysis, we just called the results of the GWR model. This is the object that we created with the GWR command, so we can call that. One thing to keep in mind about the GWR command is that the object that's created also has what's called a spatial data frame, or SDF, and that operates just like a data frame or a data object would elsewhere. So if we call this, Control R. Uh, you can see that we called the names of that data frame, and here are all of the names of the results of the GWR object. So these have the same results, the same names of our predictors of interest, but these are the local coefficients. Um, so this is the coefficient for the intercept and the coefficient of all our five predictors. Then we have the standard error of the local standard error of each one of our predictors. Here we have local R squared and <coughs> we could call some influence statistics as well uh, using that hat matrix. But let's focus on the R squared and then our local predictors and the standard errors to find uh, to replicate the results from figure two. So in order to do that um, we'd want to carry out some post-modeling diagnostics or post-estimation diagnostics. We could do a, a histogram of our key independent variable. This is our histogram of the local coefficients for ideology. Remember that this is our object that we created with the GWR command. This is the spatial data frame. So this is the local coefficient for ideology. It's not the original variable itself. So we could create a histogram of the local coefficients for ideology. You can see it's kind of bimodal at first glance. So let's take a look at it, take a closer look at that. We could create a density function and plot that. And then we could plot the histogram behind it or on top of this. There you see the histogram, the same bimodal, and you can see the clear bimodal uh, distribution with the density function. 
On top of that we could extract the OLS coefficient with this syntax and add a blue line with the OLS coefficient. So now the histogram and the density function plot the distribution of the GWR coefficients, but this blue line plots our, um, coefi our co OLS coefficient, the, o the, uh, the coefficient for ideology that was estimated by the OLS model. So looking at this, this kind of distribution, histogram, density function, etc., can give us a sense visually of the extent to which the distribution of the GWR uh, coefficients depart from, say, the, the expected distribution of, an o of the OLS coefficient. So we can get a sense for that by shading in, say, the 66% confidence interval around the OLS estimate, and we do that with this code here basically going one standard error to the left and one standard error to the right and that is our 66 percent confidence interval around the OLS coefficient. And we can bring the blue line out in front by replotting it and then we could plot the distribution of the GWR coefficients. Here is the mean of the GWR coefficient for nominate for the ideology score which the authors reported in their table one. Here's the median, which we already had, and then we can plot lines for both of those. So if we plot the density function again, uh, we can see that the median is light blue. So Again, this, this light blue line is the median, and then the uh, purple line would be the mean. So you can see the purple line is very close. The mean of the GWR estimates is, ver is almost exactly the same as the OLS estimate. Uh, so then we can plot uh, interquartile range around the median, and that's what these these sets of commands or this set of commands does, and this blue density or this blue shaded area is the interquartile range around the uh, median of the GWR estimates. So if you recall that the density of the, or the 66 percent confidence interval around the OLS estimate is the Oh, excuse me, is the gray area. Okay, now they've just gone over each other, but we'll plot them again with the gray out in front. So the blue area spans from the left boundary of the gray to the right boundary of the blue, the six, and that's the interquartile range of the GWR estimates. The gray area is within that interquartile range, is mostly within that interquartile range. So you could say that in some ways the 50% the fifty percent of the distribution of the values of the GWR estimate envelop 66% of the values of, or the 66% confidence interval of uh, the OLS estimate. So this is again one way to motivate the GWR analysis. That is that the GWR analysis is capturing variation in the estimates that is not captured by the OLS estimates. So that's a, a way to do sort of uh, motivate the GWR analysis on the back end of having done the GWR analysis. And uh, then the last thing you want to do, or one of the core things you want to do, is examine correlations among the coefficients. So you do that with this command here. This this extracts the the uh, the different local coefficients and uh, assigns the column names to those coefficients. Hang on just one second. Sorry, I just reversed two lines in this block here, so you want to extract the variables and then give them column names before you do any of the other commands. So let's do that, these first two lines, and then you can describe the variables. This is a very detailed descriptive statistics, or you can just look at the correlations. 
Uh, here, right off the bat, you see that now the ideology variable and the vote for the uh, presidential candidate uh, of the incumbent are pretty high, as long with ide ideology and the appropriations power index. So you might want to take a closer look at this, and then power and the uh, ink pres vote very high. So it looks like some of the concerns, for instance, of of people like Wheeler and Tiefelsdorf. Uh, Roger Bivand also draws attention to this, that the GWR model tends to force uh, co the coefficients uh, together. Looks like that's happening in this data here. Another way to look at that is to plot these um, correlation pairs. That's what this looks like. Here you've got the variable names along the diagonal. And for instance, you can see that this ink pres and power are highly correlated. That was the 91, 92 uh, 0 0.91, 0 0.92 correlation uh, coefficient here. Moving forward, though, um, sort of setting aside these these diagnostics for a moment, the last thing you'd want to do is to visualize the results, and those would be the maps in Figure Two. Uh, so just because this video is getting a little bit long, I'm going to stop here and do the mapping in a final video. Thank you.